Good evening, everyone. This is Jerry and Barbara with Seymour in the Word, and this is our last class on Acts, the book of Acts, and it's just been extremely informative, challenging as we have gone through this book. My life has been changed. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but my life has been changed and, and challenged and challenged as we have studied through the Acts of of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. And it's also our last class for De for the year 2023. So the first Thursday in January of 2024, we will be starting a new study on the minor prophets. And we'll be starting with the book of Jonah. And we are going to go in chronological order of the prophets, not in the biblical order of the prophets, which is different. Mm -hmm. And it's just been very interesting as we begin to look at the book of Jonah. But tonight we are wrapping up Acts. We're looking at putting a, a conclusion on this. And our dear friend, friends, Bridget and Randy Link will be leading the discussion tonight. So let's just pray and welcome Holy Spirit as we always do. <clears throat> Father, we love you. <clears throat> Father, we love you. I'm just overwhelmed at your love for us, your love for me. Father, I just thank you. All your ways are so outside of our calculations. I thank you, Father. <clears throat> That you, but you show us your ways. You show us your nature. You show us your character. But we can never understand the extent and the limits, the limitless parameters of your character. Thank you. And I thank you. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Come right now. As we focus on your word, come right now. We thank you that your word is anointed, it's powerful, and we just welcome you, Holy Spirit, to open our eyes to your word in Jesus' name. I make place for you. So our dear friends, Randy and Bridget Link in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, will be teaching and concluding this last chapter of Acts 28 and just, just kind of wrapping up and and giving um, an overview of the book. So Randy and Bridget, <clears throat> take your liberty. You got plenty of time. Well, we would like to start first at verse 16. Um, and with one comment, uh, Barbara and Jerry did a great job getting us to that point last week. We just had one comment we wanted to put on there. So Bridget, if you would, why don't you read um, uh, verse 16. Okay, Acts uh, chapter 28, verse 16. When we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. And uh, the, right before there in verse 15, it says that hey, the people of Rome, the Christians in Rome had heard they were coming and actually followed them all the way down. And Barbara did a good job last week with the map of explaining the Sapian way and the three different points there that they met people as they came. But I think it behooves us to think back to why would they think about Paul? And it's because he had written a letter to him just a couple years before as he was leaving Ephesus for his plan to come to Rome. And in it, then, he it is the book of Romans is considered the highest uh, writing for Paul of the story of Christ and the way that he explains it for both Jews and Gentiles. And so the uh, work of salvation in Romans, they wanted to meet the writer. They wanted to know who is this guy that would care for them enough to send such a letter. But I think there was probably a little bit of, huh? When Paul is presented with chains and centurion guards with him. And I think they probably had some questions wait, wait, 
the great prophet of God is being kept in chains? What kind of story is that? You know, do we have the same reaction sometimes when we come across circumstances in the fellowship of Christ where Jesus has a different way of presenting someone or something, and yet we go, wait, 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 I thought they were. It's not what we thought they were. It's what Jesus thought they were. Because remember, Paul back in, I think it's chapter 17, has already had that, or 20, I'm sorry, where he had that walk uh, from Troyes, where Jesus and he had a good conversation coming out of Corinth about what his next steps were going to be. Mm -hmm. Jesus comes to see him when he's in the house of the centurion and kept there forlorn. You know, no, you're going to Rome. You're going to make it there. And so everything Paul does is centered now on what's God's will for me that I can continue to preach the gospel. And I think as uh, Christians, you know, in our everyday walk, when something doesn't meet our expectation, you know, Paul may have not met their expectation. He had written this glowing letter full of doctrine, sound doctrine. And then here he is taken off the ship with just common slaves and common prisoners. Uh, so surely that kind of rattled their expectation. Um, so we have to be very careful, like Randy said, when God does something a different way than we expected him to, uh, because we can get hardness in our heart. We can be bitter. Uh, we can kind of turn our back on God a little bit because we didn't understand. So, um, you know, in my little time here with mom and all she's gone through, we are just constantly saying, God, we don't understand, but we trust you. And we, we don't want to give up our trust in God. And we ask God to give us our the strength and the Holy Spirit to reveal what God is doing in and through all of this. Good. It goes on. If you look at the very last two verses, 30 and 31 it says for the next two years, Paul lived in his own rented house. He welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God with all boldness and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him. Paul's kept under house arrest, but he's still with Roman guards there for a full two years imprisonment. The primary focus that Luke gives us in these pass in this section we're going to talk about tonight is that Paul had a message of the resurrection for the Jewish community in Rome. He wanted them to know that Messiah has come. Paul's given some freedoms. But attending synagogue isn't one of them, as we've seen through the whole book of Acts, or the last half of the book of Acts, of that Paul's normal actions would be to go to synagogue, present the gospel from the scrolls, and then uh, have them answer in the way they would. Well, he doesn't have that option. But tradition also says that during this time, the Romans had, a, uh, had learned quickly that what they needed to do with this guy was to change those guards every six hours because they were being converted by the prayers and the teaching and the things that were going on with Paul. We don't know if he was directly evangelizing to them or if they just, because they're having to sit there with him, they're then being touched. But when we read, I believe it's in Philippians where he says, that the uh, whole Roman guard is being touched because of it. And so they were changing out the guards there every six hours to prevent losing the Roman guards to this Christianity thing. Uh, but no record is given as to why the trial before Caesar is delayed for two years. Now, in truth, when we say there's going to be a trial before Caesar, the you didn't really sit before the, uh, before the, ac the actual... Um, uh, Caesar himself, whoever the ruler was. And so, um, but what you would do, he had a council of three very close to him, whoever the emperor was, and they were the ones that heard these cases. And if there were ones that they thought needed his input, they would come to him. But generally, they had his authority to be able to hear what he had to say. So uh, we don't know why these were delayed. Perhaps the charges were lost in the 
things that were written on the uh, shipwreck at Malta. Perhaps there were uh, accusers in Palestine that didn't come to Rome because they figured out of sight, out of mind. Maybe the calendar just wasn't accommodating. I mean, we've heard what's happened on that trip to Rome. And so all of these things, but the one thing Luke doesn't indicate is that Paul had any type of frustration or anxiety during this period, none whatsoever. He had a mission. He continued it, he evangelized, and he shared encouragement to all that would come to hear him or all that he would send to hear about what was going on. So um, let's pick up then from verse 17. We're going to go ahead and read through 28. Bridget, if you would. Why don't you pick that up for okay. me? Acts 28, 17. Three days after Paul's arrival, he called together the local Jewish leaders. He said to them, brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Roman government. Even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, the Romans tried me and wanted to release me because they found no cause for the death sentence. But when the Jewish leaders protested the decision, I felt it necessary to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no desire to press charges against my own people. I ask you to come here today so we could get acquainted and so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel the Messiah has already come. They replied, we have no letters from Judah or reports against you from anyone who has come here, but we want to hear what you believe and on, for only for the only thing we know about this movement is that it is being denounced everywhere. So a time was set, and on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures, using the law of Moses and the books of the prophet, prophets. He spoke to them from morning till evening. Some were persuaded by the things he had said, but others did not believe. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through the prophet, through, through Isaiah the prophet. Do you want me to go ahead and yeah, read go that? ahead and read through there. <clears throat> through 28. Go and say to this people, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. And when you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the parts, for the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear. For they have closed their eyes so their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Go ahead and put a 28 too. So I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles and they will accept it. Paul appeals to these Jewish leaders there in Rome. They were obviously separated from the Christians, unlike what it was in Jerusalem, where the Christian sect started out of the, the Jewish synagogue. Here in Rome, there's this mix, but it's separated and the Jews are kept uh, to themselves. But one thing to note, the Jews have returned to Rome. If you remember back in chapter 18, Claudius had commanded that all Jews be banished out of Rome. And that's why Aquila and Priscilla were in Corinth to start with when Paul meets them. God had orchestrated that one, that that relationship would continue and how they would be used together uh, in the work of the gospel. But Claudius had commanded it. Now the Jews are at least back. So there's an active synagogue. The folks he invites are unfamiliar with anything dealing with Paul. 
Uh, so he just simply explains why he's been brought to Rome. Since they didn't have any info, he just quickly summarizes it and moves ahead, as we're going to do. First, he had not, done nothing to harm the Jewish people or the traditions that they practice. In Romans 3, he very simply speaks to that part uh, that you would pick that up. Romans 3, 29 through 31, Paul gives a little note there about this relationship of Jewish and Gentile uh, working and how the faith of, and the law work together. Bridget, if you would read those. Romans 3, 29 through 31. It says, or is he the God of Jews only? He is not also, is, it, is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Remembering that this is out of the book of the letter to the Romans. So there may have been some in the crowd that had heard something that nobody else did, but maybe they had already heard this. And so Paul's tweaking, even from what he's told them before uh, he had come of this. But his conversation there is that the law is not set aside because of Messiah but rather is fulfilled by Messiah. Mm -hmm. And it is now opened to both Gentiles and Jews. And for that, Merry Christmas. Thank you, Jesus, because mm -hmm. I'm not a Jew. Yeah. <laughs> he goes on, though, to say uh, that he was given to the Romans by the Jewish leadership, that they had an opportunity when the, remember, uh, that they said, we don't even know what to send charges about. He he would have been set free. I think that was Herod and Festus uh, mm -hmm. that said, you know, we don't even know what to write. We would have set him free, but he appealed to Caesar because of these Jews. Secondly, after the multiple trials, the Romans found no reason. So thirdly, the prosecution by the Jews compelled an appeal to Caesar and as a Roman citizen, Paul does that. But he says, I don't hold any bitterness against them. In fact, I don't even want judgment to come on Judea because they had brought these charges. Let's just get this over with. That's kind of what he said. Mm -hmm. In other words, so there's nothing to see here, folks. Let's keep moving. So verse 20 picks up for us and says, but I asked you to come here today so we could get acquainted and I could explain to you that I'm in, I'm in chains because I believe for the hope of Israel, the Messiah. All good Jews believe in Messiah. They are all waiting for his, him to come. As Christians during this time of the year, Advent is a preparation for the coming of the Christ child. We should already have that same mentality. But he's saying, you might not know it, but Messiah has come. And he regarded the triumph of the resurrection from the dead as proof that Christ had come and that he is Messiah and that that is the proof that no one can deny. He goes on then to pick up that he's in chains because of it. And the Jews simply say, we don't know anything about all of this. So uh, let, tell us later about it. So, they did say the only thing we do know is we want to know what you have, what you believe and your views because of this sect of the Christians we've heard is spoken of against everywhere. Well, that just seems to be the same old, same old, doesn't it? <laughs> Not a whole lot different today, is it? That said, a large crowd came on the appointed day when Paul was ready, and he spent the entire day speaking of Jesus and the kingdom of God using the law and the prophets. Now, I don't know. I've done a few of those you know, church meetings where you have to figure out what are we going to have for lunch? How many snacks are we going to have today? I don't know that Paul did all that <laughs> or if they brought their own lamb chops and you know themselves. But that said, uh, some of the Jews believed, but he used the law and the prophets, meaning as a good Pharisee, he taught all of it. He didn't limit himself to the book, to the five books of the Pentateuch, 
but he rather did all of it. But in doing so, he was able then to bring scripture that they were familiar with, what we would call scripture, they would call scrolls, the things that they knew. But toward the end, some started saying, wow, this makes a lot of sense. And some were going, this guy's crazy. And so again, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like what happened when Paul was brought before the Sanhedrin that some believed and some didn't. And he said, hey, you know, I believe in the resurrection. That's the whole thing, guys. And they were like, well, he must be good. He must be bad. And put him in chains. And the meeting broke up with the Jews arguing among themselves. But then Paul boldly addresses them in uh, the next verses, 26 through 28. He addresses them with something that is very familiar to them. The unbelieving Jews, he has one comment as he as his pull from Isaiah, the sixth chapter. Now, for those of you that are familiar with Isaiah 6, it's the great transition chapter for, for Isaiah. The first five chapters of Isaiah, he specifically is calling for judgment for people that had turned themselves against God, and he is constantly crying, God, these are your people, but they don't trust and they don't believe and follow you. You ought to just send lightning bolts and take care of this whole thing. But Isaiah 6 starts, and in the year that King Uzziah died, I, heard, I lifted my eyes, and I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And there were seraphim that flew above him and cried, holy, holy, holy. They were loud and strong. He got a glimpse of glory of God. Aquinas, the great theologian of the uh, middle centuries, said he, he had written 17 volumes on theology, on thinking about God. He had one vision, and he said, I'll never write another word because what I have written is rubbish. It does not meet what it is. We cannot put in words the glory of the Father. Mm. Isaiah said, I'm an undone man. I'm broken. He realized everything he had said in the first five chapters wasn't about his brothers, sisters, cousins, and, and uncles. It was about himself. I have seen God's glory, and I'm not. I'm undone. And God said, no, I'm going to take fire and change you and touched his mouth with the coal and cleansed him. And then God said, now I need somebody to take the message to all of those others that they would know it. And he said, here, here I am. Send me, send me. <laughs> and when he did, God said, okay, this is what I'm going to send you to tell them. I want you to say to my people that you'll hear my words, but you won't understand them. You'll see what I do, but you'll not perceive the meaning of them. And down at the end, they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. That is a strong thing to hear. Paul tells them, now, why would this be familiar to these Jewish leaders? Because it first starts in Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29, 4, where Moses is talking and said, I brought all of you people, and y'all don't even remember uh, that this generation remembers coming out of Egypt and all of the miracles but yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. This is right before Moses is dying. So he's taken them 40 years plus the time in Egypt, and they still haven't perceived who God is. Proverbs 20, Solomon writes that the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord makes them both that this is a spiritual consideration that needs to be grasped. And Paul's saying, you Jews haven't grasped this yet. Y'all want to hear about Messiah, but you don't want to do anything when you hear it's, it's true. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's kind of interesting too, that it, this same scripture, this same reference is used by Jesus in Matthew, the 13th chapter. He's asked by his disciples, 
why do you keep teaching in parables? Why don't you just tell them plainly? And Jesus says, therefore, in uh, Matthew 13, 13 through 17, he says, therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor will they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. I think you really have to focus on that last verse, that la the end of Amen. that, that. God is still waiting. He is still ready to heal. He is still ready to forgive. And uh, so many, you know, in our country, in our world have just grown dull of hearing about God. And they're trying to search other ways to find satisfaction, to, you know, find enlightenment, to find peace. They're searching for peace and uh, they're limit, uh, you know, bypassing the Prince of Peace who says, I give you myself, I give you my peace. The world doesn't have peace. You know, we're looking for peace for Israel. We're looking for peace in our own country, in our own neighborhoods. And uh, apart from Jesus, there is no peace. And I think, you know, as Christians, we, you know, just have to guard our hearts that uh, we only look to Jesus for that peace, for that satisfaction, for that contentment. Um, so that our ears don't grow dull of hearing that ever, ever learning, but never coming to the truth. The Colossians. Mm -hmm. Well, the callousness of their hearts made the word of God unable to heal them. As Bridget was just talking about the stony heart kept them from even hearing truth. And unfortunately, there are many today that are in that same as Bridget mm -hmm. was talking about. Another reference for you, just if you're writing down references, Ezekiel 36 addresses this same conversation that Christ has. And Romans 11, 8 speaks the same out of Deuteronomy and Isaiah. To continue, though, at verse 28, he closes it then uh, with, the, with that hard word. Then he says, but I want you to realize that this salvation from God is also available to the Gentiles and they will accept it. He's telling these Jews today is the day of salvation. I'm not going to be bringing the gospel to you. I'm not going to have you for lunch every week until you accept it. Today is the day. Make a choice. He had done the very same thing in two other circumstances at uh, Antioch of Pisidia, where he shook his feet off and he said there, we're done. That's in chapter 13. And in chapter 18, in Corinth, he does the very same thing. You Jews don't want to hear the truth of Messiah. So I'm going to the Gentiles. And that continues in there. But the, the reaction here seems harsher than in the past because no longer does Paul feel he has to tell the Jews first. Now I've shared it, but I need those that are going to hear that, that the ones that God is giving ears to see, I mean, ears to hear and eyes to see, those are the ones I'm going to continue to in, uh, encourage. Paul's discussion on, on the Jews and the Gentiles becoming Christians, the grafting and uh, don't be boastful, you Gentiles, because the Jews were cut off and you were grafted in, God can just as easily cut off that grafted part. That's, that's the end of Romans 11, where he's speaking. And Romans 9, 10, and 11 is a parenthetical section there where Paul specifically addresses the Jews in Rome in the letter, Romans 8, then it skips to Romans 12, 1, and that par that parentheses of 9 through 11, he specifically speaks to the relationships and primarily to the knowledge of the gospel 
that the Jews had got, been given all of their life. But Paul had defined the argument such that even the unbelief of the Jewish nation can't stop God's plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you now, this plan of salvation is real and the Gentiles will listen to it. That's the whole main point of his entire conversation and why he bammed them with that scripture out of Isaiah 6. So verse 29, the Jews leave arguing among themselves. And Luke does a transition here for these last two verses for us. Paul continues to preach for two more years unhindered. We know that many Gentiles continue to come to Christ but as a whole, the Jewish people do not. But in Philippians, Paul says the whole Roman guard has heard the gospel. That changing out of the Roman guards in Rome, I get a chance to preach to all these Gentiles. It works. The whole guard. And so the whole guard and the house of Caesar have heard the word because of it. But as we read then, into these last two verses, we find some interesting things. First, verse 31 contains one of the four titles, the full title, the full name, the Lord Jesus Christ appears in the letter of, to the, uh, to the uh, of Acts. In the New King James, it's four times it's there in, a, in chapter 11, verse 17. Paul, I mean, uh, Peter uses it when he's defending his visit to Cornelius' house in chapter 10, and he's before the church council of James and the others. In chapter 15, verse 11, Paul is in front of the same Jerusalem council and is speaking to what has been done by he and Barnabas as they go to have the question answered do the Gentiles have to take circumcision? And again, then in verse in chapter 16, verse 31, that same title is what Paul says the Philippian jailer needs to do is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and your household and you will be saved. Paul did more than preach though during those two years. He wrote letters and he entertained friends. You see, people are more important than the process or the religious systems that any encounter. Barbara's done a very good job as she has brought us through this of things that she's been questioned in her own time because of her past religious things that she had considered that were the way it was. Religious teachings. But for herself, it's been no, it doesn't quite fit like that when I read it here in the application. People are the most important part of this. Paul wrote during that two years time, he wrote the letters to the Ephesians, Colossians, the Philippians, and Philemon during this time. They're known as the prison epistles. Ephesians, the high theology word, who is God? What can I do? I can sit in a heavenly place with him. I can walk in the spirit. I can stand before the enemy. Colossians, who is God? He is the creator of all, and he's the one, Jesus Christ, that not only made it, but he holds it all together. And from him to him and through him, all things are done. Philippians, rejoice, I say, rejoice, rejoice. For the church that he had been one time in, one time for six weeks, and out of it was birthed a fellowship that when I think it was Epaphroditus that came and told him how wonderful this church functioned, that he wrote this letter of glory, joyously telling them how proud he was to know that he was in fellowship with them. Philemon, my friend, take Onesimus and use him because I've returned him to you. But if you can return him to me, I'll take him. Put it to my charge, Paul said, the time that he ran away from you. Luke remind, remained with Paul during this full time. In 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, he we're told that only Luke is here with me. Timothy 
visited with news of the churches as he traveled and he came back and forth into Rome. He brought him news of Philippi. He brought him news of Colossae. He brought him news to of Philemon. There were others that visited during this time. We see in Ephesians and in Colossians that Tychicus is very important. And in fact, he's carrying the letters to those churches and tell them, uh, to tell them what Paul is doing. Epaphroditus in Philippians is mentioned. Mark and Aristarchus mentioned in Colossians as having been with him. And of course, we know that since he's there in Rome, all of those he had mentioned in the 16th chapter of Romans have to be from Aquila and Priscilla that he said their church and their house continue and bless them all the way to verse 15 with Olympus and all the saints that are with them that live in Rome. These folks all during this time came back and forth in through. So uh, Paul at, some, at one of those letters had said, I believe it's in Romans, don't let hospitality be something that you're not known for. <laughs> let your house, be, your door be open. So you he think he it. had some snacks there? Uh, probably <laughs> so. I don't know if there were granddaddy snacks like Theo gets, but. You know. But he and the word of God kept the people coming back. You know, Paul is in chains. Paul is in house arrest. But he is more concerned with the furthering of the gospel. And like Randy said earlier, he was concerned about people. He always opened his letter addressing people. He closed the letter and wrote the names of people, you know, that send greetings to you or, or pray for these people here. And so he was concerned about the church of God. He was wanting the uh, to strengthen the church of God. Of Jesus. He wanted to uh, strengthen the leaders, Timothy, you know, to not be discouraged. So, you know, some people say, well, maybe we don't always understand God's plan, but maybe God put Paul there for those two years so that we have all this scripture that's so rich that we can learn from. If he was still out, uh, you know, evangelizing, he may not have had that time to sit and write. And uh, so we are, we are thankful. And it does seem that Paul was just content with what God had for him. He wasn't uh, anxious and how many more days till I get out of here, but he was just letting God use him right where he was. And uh, I remember a couple of weeks ago, Barbara and Jerry were talking about, they had uh, a on their heart to uh, minister to people and maybe have a, a bed and breakfast or a respite or something. And without them even like forging ahead to accomplish it, God just put all these things into place. And now they have the perfect place to, um, to host couples or people to come to see the revival. So even when God puts something in our heart, we don't want to let that vision die, but it's not up to us to figure out the why and the how that it just to rest in God and know that he is bringing it about. I know Miss um, Lynn that they've made their plans and they're eager to go, but then God says stay. And so they're eager to stay and see what God will have for them in this season. And um so, and I, I know most of us are kind of, you know, getting to another season in life with, without having young children to raise. And it is, we need to look at our lives as seasons. And this is another season for Paul. And it was a very fruitful season, even though in the natural thinking, you know, being under house arrest may have not been what he really had in mind for the last season of his life. Well, there's no record of Paul ever having actually gone before the triune of Caesar. And some teach that Paul uh, was met by some magistrates and executed. Mm -hmm. But many believe, according to the accounts written at the time that Paul was released after this two-year period, maybe as a statute of limitations, maybe due to a lack of evidence or interest, and tradition suggests that Paul was released for a time and he visited with Titus and evangelized with him for a time and then was 
uh, captured somewhere around uh, 64 to 66 AD, which would have been during the reign of Nero, who was emperor from 54 to 66 or 68 AD. Uh, and Peter at the same time was also martyred at that point. During this period, the letters to Titus and 1 Timothy were probably written. And some believe that Paul pen penned Hebrews at the same time because of his concern for the Jews also. And finally, 2 Timothy is written when he was arrested at the, for the second time. And within days of the time of writing 2 Timothy, I believe Paul was beheaded. We know that in Rome, that his bones were kept, were kept and that he's buried in the Basilica at St. Peter's with St. Peter. Um, but I think it behooves us to look at what his last testimony was. That we look at his valedictory conversation in the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy. You start, I'll start first with verse 6. Paul writes that I've already been poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. A side note, if you go back to chapter 2, that's his instruction for Timothy to teach all new believers <laughs> is to be great soldiers, learn the discipline, finish the race, stay focused on as an athlete in the training and keep the faith. As a farmer, plant that seed, water that seed, trust that it's going to bring forth fruit. He continues, Verse 8, finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Mm -hmm. He continues as we in, stay in that chapter, fourth chapter of 2 Timothy, down at verse 17, uh, says, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me ev from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and forever. Amen. And his last farewell to all of us. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. If you look for a salutation for your emails at times, this would be a pretty good one. <laughs> May grace be with you. <laughs> Amen. You see, Jesus didn't waste any part of Paul. Nothing of his life was wasted. It was all a preparation for what God had appointed him to, and Paul was faithful to the appointment. His background, his education laid him the foundation for what he was called to do, to know the scriptures and to know being educated in a Gentile city, knowing how the philosophies of the Greek were taught. He didn't just have a Jewish teaching, he had Greek teaching also. It's for the furtherance of the gospel that his citizenship, his intellect, and his weaknesses contribute to being poured out to any that would listen, Jew or Gentile. And I think the question for us needs to be asked, are we willing for God to do the same with us? We won't know what could be done until we submit to his will. My friend Rex and his is, is um, finds great respect in y'all's fellowship, not because he's a great big guy. He, he wasn't a armor bearer, as it were, because, but rather because of his spirit that he would be uh, timid when it was time to be in prayer. Rather, whether it's in the water, whether it's at the altar, whether it's in the parking lot, Ray can, uh, Rex can take the time to pray with folks where they're at. <laughs> and that's what Paul learned. He was subject to what was needed now, and he was prepared for it. His summary of his life is actually in the letter that he wrote to the Philippians in, ver in chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 20. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ. 
whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between my two desires. I long to go to be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it's better I continue to live here. Mm. You see, the book of Acts ends somewhat, somewhat abruptly there. No one tried to stop him, period. <laughs> and there are those that would say that Paul's, that Luke's intent was to write a third letter to his friend. Um, and so, <laughs> excuse me. But Holy Spirit didn't need another another letter written. He put the period there so that it could continue to be written. It is titled in our printed Bibles, the Acts of the Apostles. The truth is, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit to develop the Church of Jesus Christ to prepare a bride for him to come. It's an account of the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the world by the power of Holy Spirit's leading. It's what Miss Lynn reminded us of last week. The book of Acts deals with the history of the church as it grew in the most influential cities of the empire. It moved from Jerusalem to Antioch, to Alexandria, the third largest city in the empire, to Corinth, the second largest city in the empire, and finally through Ephesus and to Rome. We receive accounts of miraculous events surrounding Peter, surrounding John, Stephen, Philip the Evangelist, Luke, Barnabas, and Paul, and the willingness to become martyrs for Jesus Christ. The church is held together by Holy Spirit, and all these unusual characters are tied together, whether they're merchants, slaves, jailers, soldiers, educated and rich. There are male and female, Jew and Gentile, barbarian and elite, all drawn to one, the Nazarene. Holy Spirit weaves a fellowship around a message that succeeding generations continue to deliver. Jesus Christ is Savior. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is intercessor for you today. Jesus Christ is an advocate of your life. For all who believe on his name, he is Messiah. He is the King of Kings forever. The Acts of the Apostles continues today. Jesus is seen throughout the world today by the power of the word. He is seen by the miracles of the hands of his people. And he is seen by the promise of resurrection to come because he is life itself. Each year I spend time looking for a particular scripture for Holy Spirit to set me aflame with for Christmas. This year, it happens to be the first chapter of John. And we start the first chapter of John, the first 14 verses. We usually know them well. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But a lot of times we don't spend a lot looking at what goes on in the verses between. And we find out very quickly that there are some tremendous names that are given of Jesus Christ, our Savior, Redeemer, and Lord. In verse 1, he is the word of God. In verse 2, he is the creator of all. In verse 3, he is the life, and the light was, and the life was in the light. Verse 6 through 9, if John the Baptist is the forerunner, Jesus is the runner, the faithful one who came to do the will of the Father. In verse 10, he's the firstborn of many. And 11 through 15, he's not born of human flesh or of man's plan, but he is born of God's DNA, and in him flowed God's blood, which means for us, the Redeemer bled God's blood on the cross. And for that reason, when he took it as our high priest into the holy, 
himself. It was his own blood and his own blood then redeems us. And that's why it is effectual today to all that will hear. The word of the gospel is, I want you to know the gospel is true and the Gentiles will accept it. I'm sorry. In verse 14, he is the son of God and he is the son of man. The word of God became flesh and dwelt among us that he could be our redeemer and our savior. Jesus Christ is the greatest gift that has ever been given at Christmas. Thank you for the opportunity to share. We thank you all for joining with us tonight. Let us pray in closing. Father God, we thank you for the word. We thank you that Jesus came as a babe born in a manger. And we all know that this time of year, we uh, celebrate that. But let's not lose sight of the Savior who died on that cross and shed his own blood, shed the blood of God to redeem us, that we might be might have eternal life in our hearts and that we like Paul would be led by your spirit to enlarge the kingdom of God and use every opportunity Lord that we come into that Holy Spirit would move through us and that it is all about people and encouraging people and witnessing to people and speaking your truth to people that they might hear and believe. And we just thank you, Father, that we have this group of friends that we can gather with around a computer that a few years ago, we didn't even know this was possible, Lord. But even you are using computers, you're using the airways, you're using visions and dreams, every means possible to reach yeah souls. And we just thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit will continue to draw people to the foot of the cross. And we just ask a blessing on all our friends as they go forth this week. And uh, we hope to see them again in the new year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. Awesome job. We thank you. Randy and Bridget for that uh, great, great explanation for the not only the last chapter, but the whole book and just giving us an a overview. <clears throat> so thank you again. And we'll see you guys uh, the first Thursday of the new year. Have your Bible open to the book of Jonah and we will start studying the minor prophets at that time. We love every one of you. Have a Merry Christmas and we'll see you in a new year. Amen. Good night.